There we go. Welcome to App Clover's Apprenur AppCast, and today we've got a great show for you. I'm Len Wright, co-founder and CEO of AppClover.com, and along with me today are my partner, Matthew Lutz, co-founder and CEO of App Clover. Matthew. Uh, and yeah. Jeff Williams, CEO and founder of WebLance.com. Welcome, uh. Jeff. And today we've got a really special guest. Um, we've got Mike Amerson, founder of Wet Productions. Mike is a veteran <laughs> game developer. Who has had many roles, that's not Mike, who has had many roles in the last 12 year span of his career, including art director, project manager, creative director, business development, and marketer. Um, has published 10 video game titles, including credits on mega hits such as Star Wars, Empire at War, and Call of Duty, World at War. And in 2009, Mike ventured into mobile space with the release of the hit iOS game, My Virtual Girlfriend, which was featured on MSNBC. Kotaku and the late night TV show, TV show Lopez Tonight with comedian George Lopez. So between paid and free on iOS alone, his apps are up to 1.7 million downloads. Um, yeah, we, if we had a cheer, we'd have the audience here. Mike learned to overcome the obstacle that many developers and you probably face today, which is app discoverability, which we're all facing. So I even wrote a book on the subject, which we're going to talk about more today, called The Best Book on iOS App Marketing. I love that. Of which he explains uh, to other indie developers and entrepreneurs how to overcome the obstacle of app discoverability and offer strategies that all indie developers and entrepreneurs should be using to maximize their marketing efforts. Now, wow, what a long intro that was, eh, Mike? Welcome. Yeah. Hey, hey guys. I never... Good job, Lynn. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're, we're really pleased to have you with us today, and I promise the rest won't be, you know, that long and, and, and outstretched. We're really going to get into some, some meat and, um, and, and into some really juicy subjects today about discoverability. But um, maybe we can start, start it off, uh, Mike, by just, you know, sharing a little bit more about your background, anything I missed or anything else, and how and why you got started in the app business. Okay. Well, um, like a lot of people, I was a developer. I've been in software development for 10 years or, yeah, 12 years now, actually. And uh, I just kind of wanted to venture out on my own because um, I got sick of the grind, you know, and, and I wanted to get into doing my own apps. I had gotten to a uh, video game industry just for the reason of being able to um, develop my own game. So I needed to learn the process. Um, I think a lot of people, a lot of developers get into that. They have their own ideas that they want to pursue. So this was kind of my time. I'd been working in the industry. I've been grinding. I've been doing the crunch modes uh, for a number of years. And I said, okay, why don't I put something out and just kind of test it? iOS is a real um, great testing ground. You know, it's a lower barrier to entry with just a $100 fee for the licensing development. All you need is a, a real small team. Um, we developed my virtual girlfriend with just two people. So these are kind of my reasons for wanting to branch out on my own. Well, good for you. Number one, pat on the back because, um, you know, a two-people team to be able to make those yeah. numbers and to be able to put everything together, I mean, you know, we know what it takes to be able to put businesses together and it's a lot of work, a lot of effort. So, right on. Congrats there, you Thank know. You. <laughs> no problem. Well, so, let's let's get in and tell us about your apps, you know, the success, the milestones you've reached and, and, and you know, what market they fill. Okay. So, we, we initially put out um, My Virtual Girlfriend back in um, March. I believe it was May 2010, and it didn't do so good. I was still working full time, so it was my partner. So we were both working at other development companies full time, and um, it it got a lot of reviews because of the controversial nature of a virtual girlfriend. You know, just the title alone brings a lot of people to have curiosity to see what it's about. <laughs> yeah. So um, so we had that going for us, and that was kind of intentional. Um, I, I wanted to create something that was uh, a little bit. We could grab up steam in an organic way that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we ended up um, putting out an update and then fixing it and addressing a lot of concerns that uh, the players were having with it. And then we ended up with another update. And four updates later is when it really started to take off. Other than that, but prior to the four updates, I'm kind of moving ahead a little bit too quick here. Prior to the four updates, we had um, it was like an eight-month span. And during that time, it was only pulling in about $30 a day, you know, 30 sales. We didn't have a free version. So the paid, it was just kind of limited to the pay version. And um, we wanted to improve the, the gameplay and experience up until that point. Um, so that's why we did the updates. Hmm. And eventually it, it turned out to be pretty good. And um, so I did a big marketing push in December of 2010. 
And that's right when we started getting all the coverage from MSNBC, Kotaku, and George Lopez Tonight, Discover Magazine. Well, it's interesting because, you know, most, most people that you talk about out there or talk to out there, they go, you know, the, your, your launch period, your, your first when you're out the door is your most important thing and on and on, right? This is really interesting because, you know, it didn't do so well. And, and so I bet you a lot of people that are, you know, going to be watching this, they're at that point where they're, you know, they're at that where they've launched and it didn't do as well as they maybe wanted it to. But the cool story that, you know, that you just pointed out is then you did, you know, you did a marketing um, yeah. you know, strategy afterwards and, and look at how much you've got. So maybe we can delve a little bit more into that too. And, and you know, reaching that over a million download mark must have been pretty exciting. I mean, <laughs> yeah, you know, it's got to be that, you know, feather in the cap type of idea. Share some, you know, valuable marketing lessons you've learned along the way so that, you know, people, because they've already realized, like we said, if they if they've gone out of the gate and you know the horse was lamer than they <laughs> was lame, <laughs> how do they fix it up? How do they how did you do that and pull it up? So yeah, so um, the big thing that we did was was with press release and a lot of attending um, focusing our attention directly on the marketing aspect. So as one thing as developers, when we're focusing on the gameplay and trying to put a good product out there, I'm really not much of a salesman. You know, personally, <laughs> I don't. I tried to like a car salesman job for two weeks. I quit. It was, it was just a really <laughs> bad experience for me. But um, so yeah, I, I'm I'm not that good at selling my own stuff um, actually. But it was it was a matter of, hey, you you have to be proud about what you're putting out. Mm -hmm. And prior to that, I wasn't I wasn't very happy with what I was putting out. And so when I did get to that happy point, and I was addressing the concerns of the people, then I said, okay, now now I really believe in my product. Mm -hmm. And by doing so, then I started investing the time and energy into it. And at the same time as when um, the company I was working for folded, which was instant action. And as they went down, I said, okay, I had to, you know, just do a big marketing push. I'm going to put all my time, you know, my eight to 10 hours a day that I was doing at my normal job and just start pushing in this direction. So the press release was... Um, huge for me because I could leverage the my virtual girlfriend mm -hmm. um, title you know and and I knew that that had some legs because it got the attention and curiosity yeah. of a lot of people yeah. and um, that yeah so that was a big huge thing for me and then we did um, we did a few ads we kept the budget under a thousand dollars total for um, mm -hmm. each update so nice yeah, yeah. So it was a it was a very kind of indie thing, you know. I wasn't I wasn't out there buying expensive ads or anything. Just little websites here and there to try and get some kind of exposure with that. Yeah. And then yeah. Um, we'd we'd geared the game up. You know, you have to have a good icon. I mean, I could really go into all the the different um, methods for for what it takes to really make your game pop. But. Um, yeah, well, just even good. grabbing just a few like type of idea. I mean, because it's true, and we, you know, we'll probably end up, uh, you know, not probably, we will end up getting back again and doing more podcasts in the future with you and stuff like that. But you know, and the rest is is covered in your book as well. So I suggest people, you know, check out the book as well. But maybe just. By the way, <laughs> I just ordered it, so I haven't gotten it yet, but I'm looking forward to it. Cool. Nice. So, um, yeah, maybe go into a few of those points that, um, you know, that would help some of the developers that are out there in your position, you, like you were back then. They're there now and going, you know, what do I do? I don't have a big budget. You know, some may, I don't have a budget at all. What are some simple things that they can do to, to really make that difference? Well, I leveraged a lot of social media because it didn't require a big budget, right? Um, yeah. Facebook fan page is pretty huge, but you want to start on um, – you want to start on gearing up fans of that early. And Facebook's always changing their, their pieces internally to where sometimes they publish to friends' posts, sometimes they don't, but at the time they were. So we were able to really leverage that. Um, and that, that had some legs with it. Twitter's, uh, Twitter's another good one, although Twitter isn't as strong as Facebook because you have to be a little bit more, um, I want to say, modest with Twitter and with mm -hmm. pushing these things out on people. Um, you don't want to directly try and sell to them by saying, hey, download my game because people just kind of ignore that kind of spam. But if you can engage them in some way such as like, um, you know, polls or questionnaires or, hey, what do you think we should put in the next upcoming update, you know, and kind of get them actively involved, then, then it brings awareness to their mind at the same time. So that helps out a lot. Yeah, that engaged ability is huge. 
Well, yeah, and to that point, I had a quick question to uh, regarding that. Is you know, obviously, you didn't have the out of the gate like explosion success. You know, you you ramped up and and so forth, and you've had a few updates. How much weight did you put on um, customer feedback and stuff like that, and the reviews and stuff that went into your updates? Mm, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I would say, yeah, we put a considerable amount of weight, but not not a hundred percent. Because uh, we were limited by the technology that we could do, and we were limited on by Apple. One of the big requests we get on my virtual girlfriend is more sex, right? <laughs> and <laughs> and obviously we can't do that. So um, and it's difficult to try and a real girlfriend. Yeah, <laughs> right. So it, it's it's difficult to try and uh, explain that to any customer that writes me, you know. And I would just sit there and type through an email. Oh, we can't, you know, Apple's policy on that, so on and so forth. And then. Uh, Eventually, it was just, okay, we're, we'll kind of avoid that issue altogether and try and give them something of what they want, but without pushing the boundaries with Apple. So mm -hmm. we, we were able to weigh in all the other things that we could do uh, technologically or legally and then put those out there and just let the customer kind of drive the, um, the experience. One thing, one, another one of the requests that we're getting a lot recently is more mini games and actually involvement with mini games that you could do with your virtual girlfriend. And I think that's a great idea. So we want to start incorporating little mini games, like little bowling games or um, maybe a little card game or something. So we're kind of playing around with different ideas on that now. So will the the idea behind that is uh, is there going to be any sort of reward like virtual currency or something that that is rewarded people? Uh, like basically, you're working into it, gaming theory within a game, essentially, right? Correct. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Actually, on this next update, we're adding um, virtual currency, and we're doing in-app purchases too, adding some oh. bikinis and some lingerie, trying to give them a little bit more of the sexiness that they're looking for, but without mm -hmm. actually going down the adult route. So. Yeah, that's a hard that's a hard line to walk too. It is because it's really gray with Apple. They don't they don't disclose exactly where that line is. You'll know it when you cross over it when they reject you. <laughs> and other than that, they don't say anything. So, yeah, gotcha. you, I'd be curious to hear. Like, I, I definitely want to hear back from you after you guys release that and have a little bit of time under your belt and see what kind of uh, results it yields. Just because, I mean, it's our human nature, right? Like, we are competitive beings, and anything we can do. Like, I always call it the the and I, I don't remember who I heard this from, but um, the Dropbox model, you know, it's basically like, hey, tell your friend and get more space. Well, it's the same thing. Like, anytime you can unlock anything, um, we want to do it, right? We want yeah. to keep, like, we want to keep going. It's just we're competitive. Well, that's that's another thing that we added in one of the one of the games that helped boost up the um, engagement and boost up the virility is the. Um, the achievements. So we started adding achievements to our game because achievements were big. They were happening on Call of Duty. And the game that I was working on for Instant Action, it was like a Facebook uh, Guitar Hero game. And so I was learning a lot about how to, um, you know, kind of um, go the Zynga route with trying to uh, drive installs. So achievements were one of the things that people really like a lot. And um, one of the achievements is, is, hey, share this with a friend. So when, when those OCD players that say, hey, I, I need to do all of these achievements, one of them is, hey, share it with your friends. So when they want to collect all the achievements, that was just another little push that we did to help. Um, it's addictive, man. Like, that, that's incredibly smart. You know, it's funny. This is not app-related, but um, was it Quibids? They have all these badges and seals and stuff. Like, I, I was completely addicted for, like, a week and a half, and I was like, no, I, I need to quit because I'm going to spend all my money. <laughs> I kept buying you know, all these bids and stuff, and I, just because I wanted to earn, not because I wanted to, you know, win all these prizes and stuff, it was more because I wanted more badges than everyone else. Yeah, you touch on a good subject, Matt. That's, it's the feeling of accomplishment that a, yeah. a player wants to receive, or that reward for when they do something, or it, it, whether it's earned or, or not earned, you know? In yeah. And the psychology behind it is pleasure. Yeah. Right. Because we feel we feel good when we accomplish something. The endorphins are are released in us, and we feel more of ourselves. Um, and and so that that's something that all products really strive to. So that's a really good point because <laughs> the the unlocking of those other levels uh, through that pleasure, through that accomplishment, is really strong because we're talking addiction or an addictive ability, not strong in the, as an addiction, but an addictive quality. 
because I mean, look at games. That's what they're taking in. I mean, the distraction methods that they use. Yeah. I mean, you know, it is uh, to some people it is a, a, like an addiction. So if you follow the same psychology as that, you lead them on by better and better and better. The carrot gets a little bigger. The carrots over here. The carrots here, and they just follow. So it's really about training your and uh, training and engaging the users. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Which is why I put Battlefield 3 back on the shelf. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, so this brings us in, I mean, it's, it's good. I mean, with constantly shifting uh, and evolving monetization methods and opportunities that are out there, I mean, what methods do you see working today um, that, that, you know, you see working for the next little while? And maybe what do you see coming of that in the future? Um, Cross-promotion. I think that that's huge right now, right? Um, when you can cross promote with another app or within your own app, like if you have, for, for example, I have um, the one point, actually it's 1.9 million downloads we're up to now nice. across our, our apps. And when I release a new game, what I want to do is take that 1.9 million and notify those players however I can, whether it's through email or whether it's directly in the app. The, directly through the app would be the most effective method because it doesn't require you to log into a regular computer and so on and so forth. Yeah, that's second step, people, yeah. Yeah. Second step. So, so without having that barrier uh, in the middle like that, you know, you just click on a button and boom, it launches a new game. There's a bunch of monetization, uh, ad monetization companies out there like um, Playhaven, Charboots, Tap Gauge that offer these kind of services now, and they're available for every developer. And they also offer um, many of them offer cross promotional deals where you can just do direct deals with other developers. You know, exchange one to one traffic. And I don't see <clears throat> the big competition that others do between one developer to another in the same space. In my opinion, it, when you have game A that's similar to game B, I think both games can be profitable because if, an, if a player enjoys a specific type of game, they're probably going to enjoy the other game too. So I, I think that's good when you can cross-promote with other games of similar genres. Um, it's not like the console wars where you were fighting for shelf space and Best Buy yeah. because the consumer has $60 this month and they're only going to spend that $60 once and it's either going to be your game or theirs. I see the, the app developers, I mean um, uh, iPhone enthusiasts um, and players, they, they, they buy 30 games a month, right? Mm -hmm. Or install 30 games a month. I have like 300 and some on my phone personally. So how many of you guys got? Well, you know, I got a new phone recently and uh, wiped it out. And I'm starting from scratch, so I'm not. I also <laughs> forgot to transfer all my contact information. That was not smart that day. So <laughs> uh, I only have like four screens worth right now. So. Right, right. Still, that's a lot, right? <laughs> well, what is that? What was that stat that we just ran uh, across a while ago? The average, um, the average uh, smartphone user will have what is it? Thirty-seven apps mm. uh, on that yeah. one. Do you remember that, Matt or Jeff? Yeah, no, it was. Uh, I, I think you're right. They've got in the 30s. Um, yeah. Just across the board, phone. as an average, you know, the average uh, smartphone user will have an approximately 37 apps, you know, on on their phone at any given time. Yeah. And and they also they they said that the figure for 2012 or 2017 was just astronomical. Like uh, yeah, how many downloads? Numbers. Yeah, I've got the numbers here. It was basically, okay. uh, it was a report that the Wall Street Journal um, uh, created and distributed last month in August, and it said 136 billion apps are predicted to be downloaded by uh, wow. 2017, and the average smartphone user downloads 37 apps uh, per year, I guess. Wow. But so, this is kind of cool, too. The average smartphone user in the U.S. Uh, spends 94 minutes per day using apps. Wow. That's crazy. It's an, an hour and a half a day. Yeah. That's and it's with them all the time. That's what gets me. I mean, when, with the internet, you know, it was going up when social media came in. People were spending a lot of time on there. But when they, you know, went to the bathroom, when they went out to go to work, when they went, it was left at home. Whereas now, it's with them all the time. The ability to increase the psychological, um, I'm going to call it that addiction factor, um, is huge. Because yeah. it's there tempting them all the time. When's the last time you left the home and, and like without your phone and didn't feel naked? You know, like that's oh, a, yeah. the keys, phone, hat, done. Yeah, uh, and wallet. And maybe wallet. Depends <laughs> <Yeah. about> <laughs> maybe wallet. <laughs> so, okay. 
so the that, best that, app is the, sorry, the best app is the the blacklist, so you can block people from SMSing you, block your girlfriend <laughs> from bothering you, so you can play my virtual girlfriend. Yeah. <laughs> It's like, it's a, and that's true. I've done that. <laughs> it's, a, it's a good segue. Um, you know, we're talking about opportunity um, in the app world, really. I mean, wh where do you think it is right now, and where where would you see it going in the next while? So that if you had to, if you had somebody knocking on your door saying, "I'm an app developer, an entrepreneur, I want to get in, and I want, you know, I want to spend my time and energy in the right place," do you see any places where you would suggest they spend more? Oh, you know, I, I think it's just going to really expand, uh, Len, just touching back on just what you were just talking about, um, mobility is yeah. huge. And now that we can kind of um, take what we had on consoles and move it over to mobile, I think that they're going to end up bridging that gap between console and mobile where you can take the same game that's on mobile, bring it back home, play it into your console through like the Oya or um, I'm sure Apple's going to come out the, with their equivalent um, version of the OIA where you can play games on their um, Apple TV or something, right? Yeah. It's secretive, but I'm sure it's in the works. Um, so this is where I think it's really going to be going at the next few years. You're going to have console-quality games played through your mobile devices, which you can bring back to your big TV, play them through the big TV, and get uh, a, you know, a more big, grand experience. Or you can just bring it with you on the goal and go and take it with you wherever you go. So, but do you think that's going to affect the indie developer who doesn't have a huge budget like EA or Zig or like someone that can create these Activision like huge, huge, you know, console quality games? Like, do you think? Yeah, yeah, I do. I do. I I think it's going to have the same effect that iPhone apps had to the console industry. So I think that you're going to have a mix. You're going to have uh, all these the bigger companies like the EAs and the Zingas. They're going to be jumping in on the space at the same time the indie developer will be able to jump on the space. So long as they keep the price point low for the licensing um, of the hardware to be able to develop on, like Apple did. Yeah. By opening it up and creating a lower barrier to entry at just $100 uh, licensing fee, and then you know you get your business fees and whatnot. And if you under $1,000, if you have an idea, you can put it out there. And I think as so long as they can kind of keep that model for developers, for any developers, then I think that that'll just lead to a lot more uh, quantity of games on the hardware. Yeah, I'll be curious to see how it plays out. Because one of the things I'm, um, I, I guess the biggest thing I'm curious about is if you take a game that's uh, simplistic in nature with graphics, like a doodle jump or something like that, mm -hmm. what that's going to look like on a 60-inch screen TV. Is it going to lose something? Like, you yeah. know, that's what I mean, like, the bigger budget games, sure. it's a huge canvas, and it makes sense, I think. Uh, but, I'm, you know, I could be wrong. I'm just curious how that's going to play out. No, I, I no. agree with you. I think that's going to really, I think that's going to affect the business a lot. There's always those guys that will like the really simple games, like, the, they'll never leave Super Mario Brothers. But Guilty. generally speaking, in the terms of the masses, I think that it's probably going to affect the app market once the big players can get in. Yeah. It definitely we, will. We, we, I think that what will happen too is the ingenuity, the the creativeness, the brilliance within developers and appreneurs alone as well is going to have to be upped. They're they're, they're going to have to up their game in creating something very unique that it catches people's attention and 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 yeah. say, holds it there versus the bigger companies being able to throw money at doing that. Um, it's going to be really getting creative for that indie developer to be able to to match and compete that way you know? yeah so and and networks is one way that we were talking about before is is how to do that so you know maybe just let's circle around as we close up uh, this part of it you know what suggestions or advice would you give the newbie um, who's starting to build a network you know they they understand they, they build a network I've mentioned before um, you know also to branch off not just even app to app but you can do you know other magazines in your genre other um, products in your genre because the end use customer is the same so you can build yes. networks that actually go out you know fan out even wider but I want to you know I want to get your your uh, thoughts on on building a network and starting like you know how where does somebody go and how does somebody start hmm. so um, like, that's, go ahead Oh, I was just going to say, I was just going to say to clarify a little bit more, like, you know, <laughs> the smaller indie developer may not have that network or support network built up. So, you know, how did you, how did you start with, did, was it just in your own games? Did you go to other people as well to try to, to um, you know, cross-promote with them? 
or yeah. you know yeah uh, just reaching out to other people in fact you know who um Jimmy Bears the makers of Jimmy Bears just reached out to me recently and uh, they're like hey would you you know give us a shot we're an indie developer we don't have a lot, big you know a lot of money or anything I can't offer you any uh, monetary compensation for it but you know we'll promote you if you promote us um during this time that we're trying to launch this game and um Jimmy Bears skyrocketed to one of the top 50 free apps in the US and this was from the guy who had just basically went out and contacted several different other companies and said hey you know pay it forward on my game and then I'll pay it back to you when when I reach a certain level of success so we did that for him you know we uh, we advertised his games across ours for free and said hey you know just return the favor with the same duration the same amount of installs you know if you can measure that and then you know then we're kind of one to one even like that so yeah, that's I, that's great, right? Yeah, I'd say I, I know Len right now uh, just because of our background and, and how much affiliate marketing we've done where that is a huge model is, is you reciprocate, right? You, and yep. you, you start off small. It's like, yeah, okay, I'll, you know, if you promote me now, exactly what you said, it's, it's genius. Not enough people are probably uh, realizing that that's something they can do. And it's just about building relationships with other developers and stuff like that. And, and getting out there and networking, going to the events, doing all that stuff so you can actually meet other people you know, like-minded developers that actually want to help, help yeah, that's, succeed. That's it. It's it, like I said earlier. It's I don't view it as a competitive space against the other developers. I use I view it as a collaborative space. I think yeah. that we can all stand to profit from it. And we can all stand to, you know, work together and and help each other out in this space. And yeah. you touched on a really good point, Len. It's all about the target audience, and that's what a lot of people that get into games or apps they don't really consider who they're supposed to be reaching out to and that's and that's a big um, that's a big issue I have because uh, yeah. I think that when you first start out on game at least what I do with my games is um, and any time that I was in game development I create a design doc and I identify who my target audience is going to be and is it is it going to be males is it going to be females is it going to be mostly males is it going to be what's the age range you know yeah. um, what what are the type of players is it going to be a hardcore player or more of a casual player and when you kind of narrow these down, you identify if your game is going to have a broad appeal or a little bit more niche appeal, right? Yeah. Before you begin. So that way you're not invested in all this time and energy into something that maybe only just a few people are going to end up playing in the long run, right? Yeah. Yeah. The people on the block, you know, <laughs> that you live on. You know, that that's it, it's really important because the that information we spoke about it before, but that information allows you to be able to tap into their psychology of how they play and where they're gonna play and everything else as well. So there's so much intel that can be had by knowing your audience, especially mm -hmm. like you said, Mike, at the start. But you know, even if you've got your your app or your game out there already and um, you know you're, you're struggling with it you can still turn around and know your market get to know what's the match for your game out there then go and look at other apps games other um, you know other placements in your genre that um, would be that would be beneficial and share the same audience but yeah and also you know you're a developer and so you know you have a lot of these things in your head but for a lot of folks they're hiring a team Mm -hmm. And your team is going to make decisions for you. You want to be in charge of all the decisions, but you won't be. And uh, that's going to affect your playability and, and how the game operates. And if those folks don't understand that yeah. you're, you know, it's a casual game and, you know, that maybe they're from 12 to 18-year-olds, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's going to, you're going to wind up with an app that's marketed for, you know, twelve-year-olds and plays for forty-year-olds, and it's yep. really in depth when it's supposed to be casual, and that's really important. And that's just project planning, and I think all projects need that. So. Yeah, to to your point, Jeff. Jeff, that's even it's even more so when you're working with external teams and then an internal development. It's difficult right. as an internal development to identify your target audience, but with external teams, it's it's absolutely necessary. Yeah, and you know what's great is that um, you're a developer. You have the, the the idea from your brain to your hands it'll happen you know exactly what you want you don't have to think about it and it happens but yet you still take the effort to do the proper planning for your game and and this really highlights you know when somebody is developing any project any app project and they're not planning it and they've they're working with a team it's like shame on them cuz you know <laughs> of of what you what what you do you actually plan it and 
it's almost like you don't need to, but you do it because it's a quality issue. Well, it's one of those things, you know, you said it almost looks like you don't need it. The best of anybody makes it look easy, yeah. right? Because when they're doing their job and it's do, being done properly, dang, it looks easy. The best actors out there, oh, I can act. That looks sure. easy. Sure. But, but you know, it, it's because they're so good that it makes it look easy. So, yeah. You know, yeah. again, we're talking to Mike Amerson today, um, you know, who has – look on Amazon, please – uh, find the best book on iOS app marketing. The best book on iOS app marketing. Uh, it's a great book, and um, it'll definitely be worth your while. So I wanted to get that other plug in for you, Mike, as we were going you. as well. You okay. know, um, is there now they'll get it at Amazon. Uh, do you have it also on a site, or is it just basically best to go to Amazon? Uh, the publisher is Hyperink Press, so it's through HyperinkPress.com, and I believe it's just on Amazon and BarnesandNoble.com. Nice. Okay. So, we'll, and we'll we'll mention it again, um, you know, ongoing later on as well. Right now, we wanted to also bring Jeff a little bit more into the discussion, and um, you know, sort of change things up a little bit and open a discussion topic up about app outsourcing. Uh, big, huge topic out there, and um, we're going to cover with Jeff, who is the CEO of Weblance, and we're going to also have Matt, my partner, and Mike also um, in for an open discussion on outsourcing. So, guys, let's just throw it out there. And what's what? I'll start it off by saying, Jeff, what do you think the, the biggest lesson uh, a newbie in the outsourcing field um, could, could be taught? If you had one piece of advice that you could give them. Actually, what we just talked about, which is the reason I spoke up because I'm so passionate about that, that you cannot underestimate the, the necessity to plan. Um, and if you're working with a team or even by yourself, you have to plan your project. You have to create milestones uh, to check in with not maybe even just yourself that you're achieving what you want to achieve. Those milestones need to have detailed specifications uh, so that your developer or your designer um, or your tester, they can uh, make sure that things are being deployed the way that you want them to be. So for me, um, number one is planning. But of course, you're, I, I think you're not going to get very far unless you hire the right people, um, which is, I mean, God, I could talk for <laughs> hours <laughs> on that. But yeah, planning is my own personal. <laughs> <laughs> so my, Mike, I'll, I'll hand it over to you. Do you have any questions um, that you know, you've been burning and you'd like to find out from somebody who is in the outsourcing game? Uh-huh. Um, I don't, I don't have any specific questions yet uh, regarding that, but I, I do have a kind of comment to that. I, I did try doing some outsourcing, and I got in with the, the wrong people because it was affordable. It was cheap, right? I think that yeah. that's a, a big attractor for, for a lot of people, and it was just nightmarish. Um, yeah. They, you know, they, they, he kind of preached about what he could do, and he couldn't perform at any level of anything, so <laughs> I just kind of flopped. Um, I guess my question in that case would be, what what do you recommend for um, being able to identify somebody that's not just hyping themselves up or? Um, yeah. You know, when can I ask when you hired this person, were they able to give you samples of their work and all that kind of stuff? No, no. Ask no, no. just see. Yeah, see, that's probably the that, that's the number one thing I think when you're hiring is to make sure that you're looking at their work. So it's sometimes it's a little bit hard um, to validate if it's their work, but one thing I'll say is that if they're truly performing the service that they're selling you, mm -hmm. which you want to make sure they are doing on a regular basis, then they should have a plethora of, of work to give you. Now, common you know, things are, oh, I have an NDA, I can't share it with you, or I'm not allowed to tell you who my clients are. And, and it's all absolute BS, okay? okay. <laughs> there, there really is no problem with you looking at their work. The uh, I will tell you that... Um, the um, sorry, the DMA, the Digital Millennium Act, says that all code belongs to the developer permanently, forever. And if you wrote it, if I say, for instance, I paid you to write it, uh, then it's yours. It's powering, say, my website, and I'm using it. But at any point legally, you can come back and tell me that I have to pay you a lease fee for that. And if I don't, I have to take it down. And if I don't, you can sue me. So when you deliver that code to me. You release that code. You sign a statement that releases that code to me. Now, this does not happen 99.99% of the time. So for somebody to tell you that they can't share the code with you because of a non-disclosure act, well, they own the code. And unless they've signed a release, 
to turning it over to the new owner. So that's a complete BS statement legally and, and all this other kind of stuff. But um, that's, the, that's the number one thing, I think, is to how many samples can they give you? Can you look at it? And if the answer is no, move on. Well, and I'll take it a step further just because, um, I, you know, part of my background, in, and I, I, Mike, I think we're, we're similar here. We both, um, it, you, art director, right? Was yeah. Game, right? Okay, so, and I don't know, was that in advertising or was it just, was it in gaming? Games. Was, okay. <clears throat> I come a, a, as an art director and a creative director, but in advertising, right? So different, um, mm -hmm. obviously different industries, but the reality is I can't tell you how many designers and stuff I interviewed that had great portfolios. They showed me samples, didn't mean that it was theirs, you know, or, or they worked mm -hmm. on a portion of it or whatever. Same thing for writers, for programmers, for whatever, developers. The same thing's possible for any of them to show you any work, right? I would say one thing, take it a step further besides seeing stuff, is to set up a project. If once, you, once you see that, you know, you're feeling confident and everything, I would set up a small milestone project, something really simple like yes. set up. Yeah, just test, set up a really, like, a, a one-day project. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, it'll cost you a couple bucks, but it's going to save you a lot of, you know, a lot of headache, and if they get it, they don't ask questions, they just deliver it, here you go, done, easy peasy. Okay, cool. It's someone that, that maybe you can move forward with. Yeah, that's uh, a good and point. Can I... yeah, Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> I was going to say, the other thing is just ask for references. Like, it's that simple, right? Find other yes. people that they've developed that for, and then contact them. Don't just ask, but contact them and follow up with them and stalk them until you can actually pin them down and, and find out what the experience was like. Yeah. Hallelujah. And if yeah, they're I in the mean, same genre, then ask them if they want to cross-promote. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. You know, guys, I hate to, I hate to be uh, – I'm going to give a shameless plug. Does anybody <laughs> mind that I do that? So on Weblance, we did that. One of the biggest issues you have when you hire in the freelance marketplace is you're like, I got a thousand dollar project. We create one thousand dollar milestone. I pay you third now, third later, third later, and it's impossible. I mean, there's too much risk for everybody. So, uh, one of the things we did is after you plan your full project, uh, you take one milestone at a time, and a milestone is a couple hundred bucks. Yeah. And the and you get to look at the work before you actually pay. So your exposure is less. You can validate the work. And you know, m my thing is, if it ain't right on the first milestone. Hire somebody else. That's so, a good point. Uh, Break it down by milestone. I never thought to do that. Actually, yeah, yeah. I'm that's how you do it in console you. development. Oh, is it cool? So I'm going to give you a plug too, um, Jeff, just because it's something else you shared, and I think this is a really good um, service that's offered. Is they actually have people within their network that you can pay that actually review codes to make sure it's not sloppy uh, yeah. code. It's All not right. copy coding. It's it's proper. So you can actually not only see functionality, but have someone else right. if you know coding. Have someone else go behind the scenes and, and validate it for you. That's, That's right. Really you get a third, yeah, third party in there to look at it. And I mean, check this out. It, um, it costs you twenty or thirty dollars or whatever to, to have somebody spend an hour reading what, what you know your team is doing, and it, it's so worth it because it takes all the risk away. Yeah. And that's before you pay for the work that they provided. So you know. You finish a milestone. It's a two hundred dollar milestone. You pay thirty thirty bucks for somebody to to review your code, and if it's good, pay them. If it's not, hire somebody else. Mm. Nothing lost. Oh, that's yeah. Service. Yeah. I, I find that that's that's great because especially the people that you know. I mean, they're outsourcing. More than likely, they're not the developers, or they don't have the time to be able to be doing that. So that's that's great, Jeff. Um, what would you? Are there any other? You know, this is a question that I, I hear every once in a while. Are there any, any countries that are um, favored, I yeah. guess, for the outsourcing, um, and and what reason? And is it a myth or is it true? <laughs> in your opinion, there are culture, business cultures in different countries that you have to be able to navigate uh, in order to stay out of trouble. So, um, in India, you have a lot of apartments full of fifty people, and they're all on their little laptops when their desks spread across the room you know, and they're shoulder to shoulder. And they just have no care about quality. And so you have to be very careful, um, you know, what, you know, make sure you're looking at the building they're working at, you know, and their work environment. Ask to do a video uh, meeting with them so you can kind of look around and see what they're doing. Um, and, the, and if you go to Eastern Europe, it's uh, a, a different thing altogether. You have a lot of freelancers um, and again, you know, overselling is a common 
thing that happens over there. So wherever you go, and, and it, believe me, I mean, in the U.S., we have we have our own set of issues in the freelance and outsourcing world. Okay, so you know, it's not that you know it's a foreigner thing. Um, everywhere you go, there's a business culture that you're going to have to navigate, and and you know. Um, the one like common I said, you know, in it all, Jeff, is they're all you're all dealing with humans. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, it, it is, and you know, the, and the internet especially, it's the wild west. So you know, you don't walk into a town and just start shooting up the you know shooting up the barn. You you're going to get shooting up the saloon. I mean, so you know, I mean, look at the code, check those references, uh, that kind of thing, and uh, that's the only way you can stay out of trouble. The, yeah. Uh, one of the last things I wanted to mention, where um, <laughs> you know, I'm human, and Len and I were both human. And we recently made a mistake with a. Uh, I'm not human, by the way. <laughs> well, I'm you, not. you gave me non-human advice, and we didn't take it. Uh, it was because we were <coughs> solely attracted to the price, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. It, it made me like we hired someone, tested them out on a really, really small project. So we did set up a my, you know, a small milestone. Um, completely didn't, you know, under-delivered and, and all that stuff, or promised and under-delivered, um, then had to go through the the firing process, which actually was misconstrued and then was confused and then had to refire and then a refire, <laughs> and, which is not well, something I like to do, so it was a lot of fun on my, on my part. But my point is, you know, it, it was, it's just that one first thing was the fact that the response to the email missed a couple of questions, but just the only thing I saw was the price. And I was like, oh, okay, price. Who cares that they didn't I answer the questions properly? Well, you know, that's a learning lesson. It is one of those things, yeah, like, yeah. you know that going into it, but I still made the mistake, and it price is what it is. I dove into that head first. I looked at the price, and I went, whoa, <laughs> how much we can get done, even if it's not perfect, and I, you know, blinders on, yeah. and looking at the price, and, and shiny object, and, and yeah, <laughs> it, was, it was basically pay, paying a really low price to, for a headache. So I mean, oh, yeah. it still was too much because we ended well, up paying for one work, thing. To, more work. One thing to keep in mind is, is this is very common in India, is that they will advertise ten dollars an hour, but what they will do is they'll work longer on your project in order to recover that profit that they would make at the twenty or thirty dollar an hour rate. Well, and this start. isn't something that that happens infrequently. And by the way. On Weblands, if they do any of this stuff, we kick them off. And the, the bottom 10% goes every month, no mm. matter what. So, um, you know, and we read code. So oh, if anybody yeah. files a complaint with Weblands, we'll read the code. And if it's not any good, they're not getting paid. Your money will be refunded, and we'll help you find a better freelancer. We don't want to have any of this problem that's going on in Odesk and Elance. You know, $10 an hour, but then they work 50 hours, and it should be only a 10-hour project. So... That's it really, what? it really, I guess, comes down to the point where I mean, you know, where whatever culture you're in, whatever, it it's still dealing with people and you know the personalities and the belief systems, the moral and ethic type of personality they have, characteristics, all play a big part. So it's really about relationships yeah. when it comes right down to it too. You know, and, and to that point, my last thing that I'd like to add is all my best um, contractors, freelancers, outsourcers have all come from referrals of other people that have used them. So this is important and why it's another another reason why it's important to get within, you know, to meet other app developers and appreneurs and, and like get in their circles and find out who they're using and, and half the time, you know, they'll they're more than happy to be like, Oh, this guy's kicks ass in graphics, use him. Oh, this guy, you know, will blow your mind and whatever. Like they're more than happy to do that if they're not using them full time or whatever. Because they want to support, you know, people that have helped them along the way. So that um for me, that's the most powerful way of finding people. We've we've got a handful of people working for us right now that are all based on referrals, and they've all worked out awesome. And you can find those and connect with those. We're going to actually add a community yes. section onto AppClover.com so that you know you guys can actually connect in between as well and with each other, and and talk about things that are working and not working. But up until that point, App Clover, you know, we can we can cover that stuff, and we'll be in these types of podcasts, be talking more about it. You were going to say I something. I also like, want to. Sorry. sorry. Go ahead, Jeff. I was going to say I have a business idea that I wanted to give away for free. Anybody who wants to do this, um, I create a website, and before you work with a freelancer, they can register on there. And that way, if you walk away and you have a bad experience, 
not only can you leave a full report and a profile that they can't take down, um, it'll be like a TRW, but online for your freelancers. But then they can also wear a collar, so that way, if your site doesn't come out right, their head explodes. <laughs> mm. That would be great. That I would like to mention is Jeff's opinion. <laughs> oh man, <laughs> I'm not bitter. What's I'm the just legal? saying. Not shared by you know, App Clover or its <laughs> subsidiaries. <laughs> If you have ever had <laughs> lost money on outsourcing, that yeah, is well, and we have, but unfortunately, it go. hasn't a lot. <laughs> well, you know, in, in closing, again, I want to I want to plug your book, Mike, again. Um, so, but I want to let you do it. You know, mention where people can get it and and you know what's in it for them. Um, and I'm going to hand it over to you to do that before we close. Okay. It's called the best book on iOS app marketing, and it's at BarnesandNoble.com or Amazon.com. Nice, and I know um, Matt. We just bought it, and um, I suggest everybody that is listening to this ongoing continue um, and and listening to it. But right now, just go and buy the book. <laughs> Get Mike's book because it's going to help. First of all, you said we just bought it. I just bought it. No, I know that's uh, that's the that's the uh, that's the perception oh that yeah yeah. <laughs> You'll send it to me. Um, <laughs> So are there any closing thoughts, guys? Uh, anything else you wanted to, to add either to Jeff or to, to Mike, Matt, or, or anything else, guys? Well, I just want to mention the, um, I don't know, Jeff, if you're still offering the same offer to our community or not? Yeah, absolutely. Program. So and maybe mention what that is, Jeff. Well, if you, uh, if you go to blog.weblands.com and sign up for beta, then you're going to get a free premium membership, which is uh, was two hundred and forty dollars a year uh, that you don't have to pay for. So nice, sweet nice. deal. <laughs> so everybody, we thank you for being with us today. Uh, we really appreciate it. And for uh, myself, Len Wright, and my partner Matthew Lutz, and Jeff um, from Weblands, Jeff Williams, um, we thank you, Mike, for being with us. It was an enjoyable con conversation, and we really would like you back again as well to carry on even more. Well, thank you. Yeah, I'd love to. Right on, and good luck with your book. And uh, everybody, thank you again for, for watching, and we'll see you next time. All right.